Repentant Shellis sat in a glade near Massgate, feeling the mid-year warmth play across his scales intermittently as the clouds passed between himself and the bright sun above. A light breeze carried the scents of flowers and farms through the air around him, making him think of current times as well as his childhood. He grew up on a goat farm and was intrinsically <laughs> familiar with the smells of rural life. At the same time, the floral smells reminded him of Scald, his lady love, who, while her blindness did not let her fully appreciate the visual beauty, always chose the strongest, sweetest, and most complicated of flowering species to fill the house. Penton took time to meditate out on the glades more frequently as of late, usually not far from where they once helped lay a girl to rest whose spirit was lost amongst the trees. The calm of the glade over the recent months was a welcome change over the past few years of turmoil, change, and danger that had nearly constantly hung over him and his companions. Five moments of peace to offset each moment of strife, he told himself. Though at this rate he would need to live 300 years to make that difference. As he meditated, his mind lingered over the changes taking place in the months since the felling of Falazure and Kalimkor. The calming of armies, the cleansing of dark agents from positions of influence, the rebuilding of broken towers, and the mending of broken alliances. The treaty between Beltrain and Masgate was tenuous, but well-intentioned. Neither side was really interested in a war, especially when they were still recovering from the previous conflict, as well as contemplating the fate which the world had narrowly avoided. Fate. <laughs> Penton winced a bit, despite this calm. Thinking about that moment when he had made a choice to betray his faith and purity for the good of the world, the euphoric power that coursed through him as he lay his hand on the staff of Seraphim was like nothing he had ever or would ever experience. Though under that near invincibility lay a sadness and loss, a disconnection from who he had become since making his own way into the world. He had felt almost a tangible snap as his intrinsic connection to Bahamut was severed by his act. The staff had aged Penson as well, cutting further into his strife recovery time. The outward differences were subtle, but he could feel it within. A little less spring in his step, a little more effort to do strenuous things. This was a part of the nature of life, though it was a part of which he hadn't expected to experience so soon. He knew that his time with Scald was already a short one, relative to the near agelessness of elves, and so this loss was more acute, at least for him. He was learning much about other races' attitudes regarding lifespans and ages, specifically from the perspective of the elves and even longer-lived dragons, one of which was his mother. Amelia Ravenwood was the name by which Penton had known his mother, who had left him and his family suddenly when Penton was in his teens. It was many years later and not so long ago that he had learned the true nature of his mother, that of a blue dragon named Alfaxia. It explained much about his own nature and upbringing. The blue wings on his back shivered unconsciously against the breeze as he thought of it. Penton and his mother had spent much time together over the last few weeks, reacquainting and reaccounting the days between then and her parting in his childhood. It seemed that there were draconic matters to which Alfaxia was compelled to attend, and the notion of returning to be Amelia while truly intended, fell victim to a tide of time that only a dragon can ride. Seeing that Penton had become a powerful sorcerer, Amelia tried to impart to him as much knowledge as his relatively feeble humanoid mind could manage, hoping to make up for some lost time with her son. She shared with him secrets of shape-changing, which, while a natural ability for her, Penton endeavored to learn to adapt his magic to in the process, and with some success. Amelia could sense that he was struggling with the sudden and unequivocal loss of his divine connection to Bahamut, and encouraged strengthening his magics as much as he was able. The thoughts of that connection and its absence made Penton wince once more, nearly breaking his meditation completely. In all the months since the fall of Falazure, he had not felt the presence of Bahamut at all, neither a whisper, nor a vision, nor a dream. Any and 
enhancement he had created from his draconic meditations felt like a faint echo of what it once was. Penta did not look to his dragon deity for accolades or approval, but was rather hoping to be sure that all was right with the multiverse and that the threat was ended. He had no regrets about his actions that day. He knew that he was saving his mother as well as so many others, which was so much more important than the preservation of his own power. Besides, saving his mother proved to be crucial, as Althaxia was instrumental in destroying the devious magic that had nearly annihilated everyone in Callum for. And so, Penton endeavored, with the help of Scald and Amelia, to relearn magic without the influence from Bahamut. To him, it felt something like learning to walk all over again. Spellcasting was still instinctual, but it still felt different somehow, like he was using a limb that he had forgotten about. Wielding magic was not the only thing to which Penton needed to readapt. His simple robes were forsworn in lieu of more protective clothing, as he could feel cold and heat much more acutely as of late. Imagine needing more than one outfit based on the weather. Hm. It seemed excessive to him, but it was necessary. And protecting himself from the weather was not the only thing with which he needed to reacquaint. A slight gurgling came from his stomach. He had forgotten to eat again. Penton felt her presence in his mind well before he heard the thunderous footsteps. Audrey Three was approaching. Hazelnut, Penton, I'm coming to find you, resounded in his head. Moments later, the imposing shack with long legs like that of a chicken and wings that should not be strong enough to support flight, tromped up to the glade. Audrey hunkered down nearby with her front door open. Jasmine and Lavender said you forgot again. In the doorway was a small wicker box. Penton knew that it contained a small meal for him, provided by Jasmine and Lavender, which was Audrey's name for Scald. Penton smiled. He felt a bit foolish about having such a difficult time remembering to see to basic things like food and water. He was sure he would get the hang of it again, eventually. Living for years going from crisis to crisis was harder than he had thought it might be in getting back into the pace of a relatively normal life. Restlessness vexed his inner peace, and while making a home with Scald had been a magical experience, both literally and figuratively, the feeling that things had been left undone persisted. Ticks might say that it was a trauma response. Penton didn't know much about these things. Deep down, he lived each day like everything might end at the turn of a corner. And in a way, this made each day more vibrant to him. He tried not to waste one moment of his time with Scald, and took these moments of meditation at first at her behest, though he had come to relish them in his own way. Feeling the time of meditation passing, Penton stood and walked over to his hut companion. He opened the wicker box to find a section of bread, some cloth-wrapped cheese, and a glass bottle of water. Skull thinks of everything, he thought. He took a long drink from the bottle, sating what he then realized was thirst. As he tore a piece of bread for himself and broke off a piece of firm cheese, Penton felt Aubrey begin to shudder. Not, not from fear, exactly, but from power? She wasn't so much shaking as she was vibrating. Something powerful was nearby, approaching. Penton could feel it on his skin now as well. A tingle that might precede a lightning strike, were the sky not mostly clear and calm. Keeping still but reaching out his magical senses, Penton felt the air turn to what he could only describe as a metallic coolness, like a bar of silver brought up from deep underground, subtly chilled to the core even in the warmth of the sun. No, not exactly silver, but platinum. The feeling pervaded the glen, causing everything to go still. Penton ran through the list of spells in his head with which he might defend himself. By the energy, lightning won't do, he thought. Maybe fire might... It was then that Penton realized what he was sensing, feeling. It was an energy he hadn't felt in nearly a year now. Something for which he'd been longing since. Turning slowly, he found himself taking in an image that both perplexed and awed him simultaneously. Before him, at the center of the glen, 
stood a young-looking, beautiful male elf, clad in well-cut robes of blue intricately trimmed with silver. Scattered about him were seven squirrels, chittering and scurrying, but always nearby. The young, but at the same time ageless, elf had a look of confidence, bemusement, and empathy all at once. At the same time, though, somehow also standing in the very same place was an enormous silvery dragon towering imperiously with a gaze of such penultimate power that Penton found himself looking away back at the elf. It was odd to Penton that he was able to see both figures at the same time and in the same place, but could choose to look at only one of them. He felt his mind might break if he gazed too long at the visage of the worm. The squirrels flitting about all stopped and turned their attention to Penton. Not in a fear response, but in curious attention. The visage of the dragon staying behind, the young elf took a few steps forward. A voice arose, both gentle and calm, and at the same time as loud as a struck gong the size of a mountain. Do you know me, Penton Shellis? At that moment, the breeze cascaded across the glen, buffeting Penton, almost blowing through him, and the memory of a companion falling, falling, he and his friends doing everything in their power to stop their friend from plummeting to his death, Penton calling out to his patron for guidance and strength, and being met by the same silvery wind. Penton's eyes widened, his wings spread out and stiffened, and he found himself somewhat recovered from the shock of seeing a god and being able to move again. He took a few steps forward, but then fell slowly to his knees. I I know you, Great One. I, I know you, Bahamut. I know you. Penton's cheeks felt wet. Was he crying? He wasn't sure. I have long been awaiting to hear or see but a sign from you, and now... Yes, he was definitely crying. Penton could feel Bahamut's smile, even though he wasn't looking directly at the being. Dear boy, one who has done so much in my name need not kneel before me. And suddenly Penton was standing up, though he did not remember doing so. Perhaps he was blacking out. Penton's voice shook as he spoke again. I, I feared you had left me to my fate for my transgression. I... I do not doubt your judgment. I just hoped that I could seek absolution, at least for my intent. I saw no choice but to save my mother from a horrible fate. The elf's head tilted slightly. Any good son would do the same. This I understand. Sacrifice is a high moral, one which I value wholly. Penton sighed, feeling something release within his chest. He then knew that his loss of his connection was practical and not a punishment, per se. Thank you, Great One. It was then that Penton felt a delicate surge of energy behind him, one with which he had become reacquainted. The commanding form of Amelia Ravenwood stepped up behind her son, standing somewhat defiant, if somewhat deferent, in the presence of Bahamut. I would not have my son punished for reversing my failure to fend off a horde of illithid great Bahamut. She said his name not with awe, but more like addressing a superior officer. Penton and his comrades have done much for you, and for many other gods. I would see him restored. Bahamut turned his overwhelming gaze to Penton's mother. Althaxia. Though I have known your story, I continue to find it interesting your choosing the path you have taken over the last hundred years. But that is a conversation for another time. The Avatar of Bahamut returned his gaze to the spell scale. Removing your tether to the Divine was a choice I made for you, Pendant Shalice. Your using the artifact to save your mother seemed the perfect time. Pendant was gobsmacked. His connection was withdrawn deliberately? May, may I ask why, Great One? D did I fail you in some way? Bahamut smiled again. No, not at all, boy. 
You did as well as anyone could expect a mortal to do in such times. He stretched his hands out to his sides. You and your friends saved many lives with your actions, both mortal and immortal. Our thanks is great. Penton let that sink in for a moment. Was a god his god thanking him? As he pondered, Bahamut approached more closely, a mere step away. Penton was sure that he could sense the Great Worm choosing not to incinerate his physical form for merely being in their presence. I chose to give you the time to experience the material realm as a mortal for one last moment, Bahamut continued. To be with those you love and feel the world without the filter of the divine. Penton contemplated that for a second, how ten months was but a moment to a god, but filed that away for another time. Instead, he said, I don't understand, Great One. One last moment? Has something happened? Bahamut looked to him more intently, nearly to Penton's discomfort. Everything has happened, and nothing has happened. You have happened. The young elf avatar steepled his fingers together before him. Penton Chalice, I have come here to ask you to divest yourself of this mortal form and become my scion. Penton staggered back a bit, feeling like he had been hit with a hammer. Scion? To Bahamut? A great one! Sur surely there's another more worthy, more competent to... No other mortal has shown me such dedication as you have shown me. To your comrades and to the cause of saving this realm. There is no other in my purview more worthy for such a task. Penton stared sightlessly forward, thinking inward about the monumental possibility to be the right hand of a deity. The image of Scald came to Penton's mind, and the world stopped. How could he leave her behind? How could he leave there? You will not be abandoning your love completely, Bahamut said, seeming to know Penton's thoughts. You will still have a connection with her, though you will be different, and will be away for periods of time. Penton wondered for a moment how long periods of time might be in this context. There would be absences, but then, was he not just moments ago lamenting his relatively fleeting time with an elf for a mate? They could be together far longer than if he were merely mortal. The prospect suddenly didn't seem so daunting. He asked, Would I be putting Scald in jeopardy? The young elf raised an eyebrow. No more than you already have. Good point, that, Benton thought. Can, can I talk to her first to let her know? Of course. Just say aloud, I am ready when you are done. And with that, Bahamut waved his hand and there was a flash. And suddenly, Penton was standing in front of Scald's jewelry shop. Penton ran in excitedly and found Skull standing at her jewel-crafting workstation, a small ruby half-finished in her hand. He couldn't help but smile. Hello, my flower, he called her. Hello, my dragon. Keeping her attention at her station. I trust your delivery found you. Chuckling slightly, she continued wryly. Or did you die of starvation again? Oh, we'd find me quite well, thank you, he replied. Audrey was most insistent. Good girl. I have found that I can count on her to get you to pay attention to yourself. Pitton paused for a moment, unsure how to continue. Um, Audrey wasn't the only thing that found me this morning, he said slowly. Skald halted her task and set the jewel down, turning her head toward his general direction. I know that tone, Penton. Something's amiss. What has happened? Penton paused again. I... I finally made contact... With Bahamut, Skald let out her breath and smile, both with joy and some relief. Oh, that's wonderful. Was it a, a sign? Did he speak to you in a vision? It, it was more... it was more than that, he responded. He was actually there, himself. It, sort of. Skald's sightless eyes widened. There? Right there in front of you? She turned fully and approached Penton carefully moving through the room so as not to bump her growing belly into any tables or 
display counters. She took his hands in hers when she reached him. What did he do? What did he say? Penton squeezed her hands in his at her touch. He, uh, he told me I was, I was not being punished for using the artifact to save my mother. He cleared his throat. <clears> throat> um, in fact, he, he said that he took my divine connection on purpose in order to give me a chance to be in the world and with you uh, a little more deeply for a time. Skull's head tilted at that. Well, I guess I can appreciate that, she said, softly smiling as one hand moved to lightly cradle her belly. But then her face darkened a little. Wait, for a time? What could that mean? Penton paused. Skull's tone became more intent. What does that mean, Penton? Penton placed a hand on the side of her face. Uh, Bahamut wants to make me his scion. If a person could fall a hundred feet and still be standing in place, it would come close to how Skald looked at the moment. He, he wants to take you away from me? Tears quickly welled at the corner of her eyes, and her hands gripped the front of his robes as she feared as if he would disappear that very second. From us? She continued, glancing down to her swollen midsection. Penton tried to be reassuring. Uh, no, 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 not away, my flower. Just, just for periods of time. I, to do, you know, scion things. He tried to exude positivity, but only ended up sounding like he was trying to make sense of what he just said. Uh, we would still be together. Uh, in fact, uh, he chimed with more confidence. We would be with each other much longer, since, you know, I wouldn't be quite so... He tried to find the right way to put it. So... mortal? I'd be a mate more worthy of an elf. Skald feigned a glower in Penton's direction and slapped on his chest. You silliest of gooses, you already are worthy of an elf. He noticed that her breath was getting labored and registered that this news was putting more stress in her already stressed form. He guided her to sit in one of the store's guest chairs and knelt before her. I want you to understand, he told Skull intently. If you wished it for you, I would say no. Skull's intake of breath at that was sharp. Don't you pin this decision on me, good sir, she said sternly, pointing down towards him. I will not be the thing that causes you potential regret. In a softer tone, she continued. If you will not be taken from me forever, then who am I to keep you from your destiny? With that, she offered an attempt at a reassuring smile. Penton returned the same smile to her. I promise you there is no god, no obstacle, no distance that would keep me from coming back to you. The faintest glow shone around him for a second or so. Woe be to those who would come between us. And you must be here for the birth, well before the birth. I won't have you shirking your fatherly duties. Pendant chuckled. <laughs> this I vow. He thought for a second and said with bemusement, I happen to know a very good midwife if they're available. Skull took a deep breath and stood, drawing Pendant up with her. So it's agreed then. You will go off and become the right hand of a dragon god and be back in time to become a father. Penton laughed at the absurdity of that decree. <laughs> so it shall be, my flower. They sealed the pact with a kiss. A very long kiss. Eventually they parted from one another and Penton said, Okay, now step back and watch. There's about to be some god power thrown about, so I want you to watch and tell me what it looked like. Skald raised an eyebrow over one sightless eye. You know what I mean. He took a step back. I love you, my flower. I love you, my dragon. Okay, here goes. <clears throat> he cleared his throat and stated probably too loudly, I am ready! Another flash, and he was back to the glen where he had stood before. And the council took three days just to get around to choosing who would record the meeting, Althaxi was saying. For all their ferocity, dragons can be so slow, responded Bahamut casually. I hope I'm not interrupting, 
Petten chimed in. Oh, you're back. His mother smirked a little. Honestly, I thought you'd be away a little longer. She followed with a wink. Mother, please, he admonished, turning a darker shade of blue. Amelia approached her son and took his shoulders in her hands. I want you to understand something completely, Penton. While you're away, your darling, darling wife will be under my personal protection. A bit of static played along her dark hair. They will come to no harm by my word. Penton could feel from the tone that this was not just a mother's promise. This was a dragon's promise. He found himself wondering which was the more to be feared. I believe you, mother, and I take great solace in it. He raised his hands to hold her arms. Thank you for everything. They embraced, and then after a moment she said, I have discussed the situation with Bahamut, and I wholly approve. She kissed him on the forehead, right on the mark left there by Braun so long ago. Now, go, become a scion. Penton stepped back and straightened his robes and turned to the young elf. Penton saw the avatar looking above and behind him toward Audrey. He turned to see what he was looking at and spotted Aphiel cowering behind the stovepipe protruding from Audrey's roof. Come down, little bird. I have a task for you as well. Aphiel fluttered down and alit on Penton's shoulder nervously. Kirk, you sure this is safe? The bird asked his master. As sure as I ever am, he quipped quietly, with about as much confidence as he felt, and stood as straight as he could. The elven avatar approached more closely. Penton Chalice, I will now imbue you with the tiny part of my essence, so that you may serve me with a strength of form that matches your strength of will. Bahamut reached forward with one finger pointed, and at the same time, a pointed claw rose from his draconic avatar as well, until both touched him on the forehead at the same moment. If Penton considered holding the Staff of Seraphim to be an overwhelming surge of energy flowing through him, it was now more a mere shadow of what he experienced in this moment. It was as if every cell of his being were being turned inside out. And in this instance, maybe they actually were. Light seemed to stream out from him and pour into him at the same time. He somehow still heard his raven companion let out a straightforward, terrified, Gah! as she went through some sort of transformation as well. His wings felt stronger and broader. Was he growing taller? The divine energy, similar to what he'd felt before, flowed within him only multiplied a thousandfold. The entire multiverse seemed to swirl around him, and then suddenly he was himself again, standing there in the glen, on the ground, looking dizzied, was Aphil. A short way was his mother and Audrey. Amelia looked at him as if he'd grown an extra head, but at the same time seemed to beam with pride. Audrey was doing her little dance that she did when she was nervous or excited. Penton didn't seem to feel any different at first, but he noticed that the world around him seemed more vibrant. His movements were light and effortless, and he felt almost compelled to fly. He thought, well, what now? In his head came a response from Bahamut. Stretch your wings and find a safe place to test your new power. Then come to me when you're ready. You will know the time. He turned to his mother almost casually and said, You know, I'm rather in a mood to take a spin in the air around above the city for a while. Care to join me? It would be my sincere pleasure, my dear boy. She straightened herself and then in a flash, Althaxia took her true form and the blue dragon began to ascend through the sky. Afield joined her, growing a few sizes as well, to not feel too minute near the worm. Penton stretched his wing and took flight himself. It was then that for the first time the dragon bolt Penton Chalice took flight in the form he would take many times in the future, that of a huge platinum blue dragon, scales glittering in the midday sun. 